say? What do I say? Um, do I introduce you? How you doing? Uh, I don't know whether you give a fuck about this. If you do, great. If you don't, no problem. Switch off now. Uh, no doubt the keyboard warriors are watching it with the standard contempt. But we're going to try and give as honest a breakdown as possible of what Charlie was about, why it became what it became, how it became what it became afterwards, what it's about and why, what it's not about and why, uh, where its strengths and weaknesses are and were. And uh, genuinely all we can do, I'm not going to try and bullshit or obfuscate or anything, we're just going to tell it like it is. If that interests you, great. If it doesn't, switch the fuck off now. Thanks. Okay. Let's talk about the original idea for Charlie and um, where it came from and what inspired it. Cool. Well, I'm, I'm a bit of a fucking asshole at the best of times. So I, I used to be homeless and I used to watch people pass by in the streets and I used to think, I wish they would stop for two seconds just to have some sense of awareness beyond the fear of their suitcase or their suit or their fucking job or their car or their expense account. And I saw firsthand the astonishing separation between those who have and those who don't. But then I saw the other side of it where I remember sitting outside a bank with a hobo one night, or one day, it was about half five in the afternoon. And we had a, f had a few drinks and I was about 17 years of age. And he was a beautiful man. He used to live with a whole bunch of hobos. Stay with him for a while. But he says to me, we were sitting there and he says to me, look at all these people passing by. He says, they look at me with sympathy. They look at me with sometimes shame. And he says, what they don't seem to understand is that in their lives, they've experienced nothing. But in mine, despite the pain, I've experienced passion they will never know. And that blew my fucking mind. It blew me away. It was incredible. And I agreed with him. So the idea of separation became something that I was fascinated by. And the idea of perception versus reality became something I was fascinated by. And one of the things that amazed me was the idea of what it is to be in a position of power where you feel weak, what it is to be in a position of power where you're a coward, what it is to be in a position of apparent heroism or apparent social elevation when you are the worst, most mealy-mouthed, mediocre person imaginable. And there were two things that happened. It seemed back to back, but it was probably a huge time frame in the difference, but there was a killing in Dublin. It was outside the Annabelle nightclub. And I won't say the kid's name, I know all, all the facts and all the background to it, but I don't want to feel like I'm exploiting it or seem like I'm exploiting it. And I remember seeing interviews with his mother and everything. They were incredible people. But the bottom line is, the guys who, who kicked him to death, their daddies were connected, socially connected. And because their daddies were socially connected, these guys got away scot-free, apart from one whose, daddies, whose daddy wasn't really connected as much as he should be. And I know his name as well, and there's no point in saying it, but... I remember being on the queue in Cine World to go and see a movie one morning. I used to go to the cinema all the time in the morning. And I remember standing in the queue and a guy turned around and he looked at me with fear in his eyes. And I remember thinking it was strange because we were in a cinema and there was no reason for him to have fear in his eyes at 20 past 10 in the morning. And then I realised it was this kid. It was this guy whose daddy was not connected, who was almost hung out to dry but then got away for this killing outside of Annabelle Nightclub. And the fear in his eye was incredible. And I think it was because when I looked at him, I thought I knew him because he looked at me like he thought he knew me. But it's only afterwards I realised that he was looking at me as a potential threat because he must have spent all his time afterwards reassessing who he was dealing with and why. Then the second thing was there was a, a librarian, a rural librarian, who had the living shit kicked out of him on Grafton Street, which is the main money dairy in Dublin. And the two guys who did it were two tennis players from Sutton or some such area. And these guys' daddies were connected again. And they beat him for the same reasons that the other guy was beaten to death. Um, anyway, the bottom line is, I'm rambling away here, but the bottom line is that I felt that there was, uh, not that I felt, there was very evidently a, a multi-tiered system in Ireland, not even a two-tiered system. And that system protected, was constructed to protect those at the top. And I was fascinated by the cowardice of those in power, not by their strength or not by their arrogance or not by their sense of entitlement, because all that was evident. But I was amazed by their cowardice. And I wanted to write a character that was such a, such a blatant coward, such a degenerate lowlife coward, but who did everything in his power to appear to be a man. And that's where Charlie was born from. He was born from 
a generation of disenfranchised, in their eyes, disenfranchised in the terms of masculinity, in terms of the ability to fight for who they are as a man. So these guys would go to the gym and work out. These guys would drop Viagra and snort coke and have sex with some stranger and feel like a man, but not man enough, so they go and fight with somebody. And they hated, they, they, it's funny because the working class were, were celebrated on a level that was born out of something deserved. The working class were celebrated on a level that was, in this culture, and, but in, in, a typical example would be African American culture, where the African American culture took over mainstream music and made standard musicians realize that there were eunuchs in the whorehouse. In Ireland, I think there was a whole, a whole generation of guys who felt that the working class were given way too much power, way too much credit, way too much mythology or romanticized celebration. And they felt that they wanted a piece of the pie, the masculine pie. And they were all hooked up on Coke, whacked out ahead in cheap Coke and Viagra. And they wanted to fuck somebody up. Mm. I'd seen this way too many times. But there's, ter- there's two Charlies really, isn't there? There's, Charlie, there's the personal Charlie and there's the metaphorical Charlie, isn't there? By the way, I apologise. That was fucking nonsense. Uh, it's funny because there's two Charlies. <laughs> it's, 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 it's funny because we've done a lot of interviews. By the way, Johnny Elliott is interviewing me off camera here. He plays Jimmy in the, in the film. And we've been to all over the world. We've been multiple places. And we've done multiple interviews, but this interview was strange because my brother is doing the sound. Emer and his grandma is doing the camera. And these are people who worked on the film. So it's, it's, it's like we're trying to strip back on the P.T. Barnum side of it. We're trying to strip back on the fucking show of it. The idea behind Charlie, and this is going to sound pretentious to all the people who accuse you of being pretentious, but fuck them. I understand the Aristotelian construct. I understand three-act structure. I understand more about screenwriting than most of the fuckers who are condemning me for writing a shit screenplay. And I wanted to write a different kind of screenplay, not to be self-consciously ambitious in some degenerate sense, but I wanted to explore a character. I had seen multiple politicians, for example, and you look at any of these talent shows, look at any of that stuff. These guys know the narrative. They know exactly how the narrative is supposed to unfold. They know exactly how to manipulate, how to capitulate when necessary, how to obfuscate, and every other fucking gate you can think of. These guys know exactly what to go through, what not to go through, when to pull back. When to, they're, they're brilliant actors. They're brilliant liars. And I wanted to write a narrative that was meticulously structured. Aristotelian three-act structure, all that stuff but have a central character who deliberately ignores the narrative necessities. So, for example, in Charlie Casanova, he knocks down a working-class girl in a hit-and-run. The inevitability is that the cops are going to pursue him and we're going to have a detective kind of scenario. I wanted to dispense with that immediately by having one police scene. Again, or my brother played the, the cop. But one police scene that demonstrates not just Charlie's power, because Charlie is terrified. The only single emotion that Charlie has is real is fear. Everything else he fakes. Everything else he fakes. He fakes using Viagra or he fakes using whatever. But the one thing that he, f- he fears most is being in a position of exposure. And we had this scene where he meets the cops. And the cops pull him in because they have irrefutable evidence that he is a con man who was burned out of his own car. But very quickly he discovers and realizes that they have no power. So the whole point of the scene is that the police don't do their basic job. The police are basically incompetent fucks in this country. And the the only time they will ever do anything is where the evidence is so irrefutable that they engage with it. But then those in power can deal with irrefutable evidence and dismiss it in a heartbeat. So that narrative plot point is suddenly gone. So those who are interested in standard constructed narrative in cinema would feel robbed of something there. They would feel robbed that the the death of the girl has no consequence. That's its very point. So when you have someone like Bradshaw from The Guardian saying that Charlie is unintentionally obnoxious, I can't believe that he would be so far removed from the function of the film to think that it's unintentional. 
the whole point of someone like Charlie, the whole point of the structure of the narrative of Charlie, is that this guy does everything in his power on every level to make the world conform to his notion of what it should be. So reality is irrelevant, precedent is irrelevant, morality is irrelevant. The only construct he exists within is the Charlie construct. So as a result, I can understand, and this is to you, whoever the fuck, but I can understand why so many people will be so frustrated by the film and so frustrated by the lack of cathartic res resolution or the lack of transformation or the lack of reversal or the lack of evidence structure. All of that is deliberately subverted by Charlie, by the character of Charlie. So everything that is a plot point, everything that is put as in the form of seed to be paid off later is never paid off later because this guy has absolutely no interest whatsoever in the real world or the narrative world because his narrative is what is most important which I see in politicians, which I see in leaders across the board. So when you look at something like Charlie and you look at a character like Charlie and you look at the world that exists in, it's very, very easy to go, he talks too much. Of course he fucking talks too much. These guys talk bullshit. These guys have spin doctors write speeches for them that are deliberately constructed to make sure there is no pause for interjection or to make sure a law is passed in society or in government where no one can interject anyway. And it becomes a series of monologues, and those monologues are constructed in order to obfuscate smoke and mirrors, make sure that, to, that they can manipulate you into a sense of either you react to what they have said, or if you react to something else that is more true than what they've said, they just reject you and relate back to what they've said, which is a carefully constructed lie anyway. So all those elements are in Charlie. Those who got it, really got it. <laughs> and those who fucking hated it, hated it with a venom beyond measure. Because they, it's funny because I really have no problem with people not liking the film. We've been through this from day one. A lot of people don't like the film and we intended to make a divisive film. And the, uh, the cards, explain the cards. The, um, the, 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 everything's, everything's the chance but it's not, but it's... Well the cards are another, it's funny because there's two, two levels of the cards. The idea of the free market, the idea, we discussed this before, but the idea of the free market or the idea of these guys giving everything up to chance. But that's also a fallacy. The cards are like everything else in, in Charlie. They're all MacGuffins. And again, for, for your audience, a MacGuffin is the, the idea where you present something as if it has meaning or as if it has narrative context that's going to pay off later and in reality it's just a scam. It's a con. It's a con by the filmmaker. And everybody relates back to Alfred Hitchcock for the MacGuffins. But the idea of a MacGuffin Everything in Charlie's a MacGuffin. Everything is constructed to lead you into thinking that you know what's happening. And then this character, the central character, who defies... And again, I don't give a fuck if you accuse me of being a pretentious prick, but Charlie defies the parameters of narrative. He defies the parameters of cinema. He, per, he defies the parameters of what a story should be. That's how he's constructed as a character. And maybe that's theatrical. But for me, it's always been a cinematic form where you're sitting in a, in a theater and you go, I don't quite know what's happening. And then you go from, I don't quite know what's happening in a delicious sense because the filmmaker is tickling your genitals a little bit to going, I don't know what the fuck is happening. But you get angry because you think the filmmaker has lost control. It's not, it's where the character is fucking with you. And it's where the notion of what should be happening is not happening. And I think that's what's happening in our government now. I think it's what's happening in Ireland in the most evident way imaginable, but I think it's happening globally as well. I think we have, we have from extraordinary to kind of mediocre actors who are auditioning for roles of power, and they're getting it. They're getting the roles. And Charlie is a character who every single engagement is designed on every level to get from you what he needs from you in order for him to progress and dispense with you. And that's our in daily engagement with government, our daily engagement with those in media who control our perception of what is and what isn't. And Charlie is a reflection of that. So I can understand why so many of you fuckers hate it and don't get it. And when people said, it's funny because I've been accused of wearing it as a badge of honor. I'm not suggesting because you don't like it that somehow you've, you failed, you haven't. I'm not suggesting that because you don't like it somehow I've succeeded in something I haven't. But please have the fucking courtesy to recognize that we are not imbeciles who are making mistakes. We know fucking exactly what we're doing.
the idea of the Aristotelian construct on the simplest level, on the absolute simplest level, the idea of structure is that you got theme, plot, character, major turning point and resolution. That's the structure of most Western cinema, most Western television, most Western theatre. But theme is the reason it was written in the first place, the point you're trying to make, the question you're trying to examine. Plot is the story of that theme. Character is the people that you tell that story of that theme through. And then the character is defined by what the character wants. So a character is defined by his objective. And that objective is normally something noble or decent or somehow enabling for mankind or for the viewer. And then the character experiences multiple obstacles. And in their determination to overcome those obstacles, the character is elevated to a better form of self. And then there is a cathartic reaction when the character goes through a major turning point. The major turning point is where the character's sense of self and their place in the world is turned 180 degrees, where they suddenly realize that the thing they thought they wanted, the material thing they thought they wanted, was less relevant than the humanistic need, which is to engage in love or engage in betterment. And by extension, there's a cathartic response in us as an audience, and we are bettered by watching the process, therefore elevated by art. And the resolution is where we walk away going, we didn't have to engage with that tragedy or love story or romantic comedy or whatever to walk away into our life and become better people, become braver people, engage in the notion of our better possibilities. That's on a very simplistic level. That's the, in the structure, the, the nature of the Aristotelian construct. And I'm a big believer in it. I'm not at all dismissing it. I think it's a wonderful thing and a wonderful aesthetic aspiration. But Charlie, Charlie's a different breed altogether. And Charlie defies the categorization that is necessary for that cathartic transformation in an audience. Charlie keeps on breaking the rules of engagement. And it's not that he breaks them in, in some way that I think is a new invention or any of that kind of nonsense. I don't. I don't think for a second I'm, I'm, I'm creating anything new. But I do want to examine these guys, back to what we said earlier, these guys who know the narrative, they know what makes people have a flutter in their heart. They know what makes people have a shiver up their spine. They know how to exploit and manipulate our inherent decency. And they know how to appear to be heroic. They know how to use language to manipulate and exploit and through the apparent process of elevation to destroy us. And that's what our, our government is doing right now. That's what global governments are doing right now. And Charlie is that new breed of Antichrist who walks into a room and makes people think that he's not a real threat, makes people think that he's just a babbling moron, makes people think that he's either a charismatic, extraordinary man or just a guy who uses a lot of words. But he's as equally dangerous in both manifestations. And Charlie is the antithesis of the hero. He's not the anti-hero, because the anti-hero is something that has been brilliantly explored in Hollywood and, and France and multiple other places. But Charlie is not the anti-hero. He is... He's a, he's, a, he's a coward dressed as ordinary who, in his mind, is a superhero. And he's the worst kind of danger in society. And he's never been more prevalent. And Charlie Casanova is an attempt to explore him. So did you not um, apply the Aristotelian construct to Charlie because you couldn't face Charlie going through a metamorphosis and becoming a better person for what he was and, and the fact that that's not reality? No, in Charlie's eyes, he becomes a better person. In, in, in the end, when, bizarrely, for those of you who are watching, Johnny is asking the questions and Johnny is the guy who's killed in the film. He's the guy, he's the only guy who stands up to Charlie. There's two people stand up to Charlie, but he's the only guy who stands up to Charlie and gets killed because of it. In the comedy club, and in the toilet later, and then in his own home, where Charlie breaks into his home and fucking kills him. As he watches the Oroctus Report, which is the Irish government televised show. Charlie believes he goes through a profound change. Every time Charlie engages real, significant, genuine, significant questioning, or every time there is a rebellion against Charlie's ideology, he gets frightened. 
and it happens his sexuality where even though he's using sexual enhancement drugs to make him feel more like a man he's exposed as being a pathetic weak man and he blames his mother's death then it happens when he confronts you in the bathroom and he has the crap eaten out of him but as soon as you leave the room he starts screaming you don't know what i'm capable of you don't know who i am and he builds himself up the charlie construct the mask of charlie the clown of charlie he builds himself back up then he's on his, the roof with his best friend and he throws his friend off the roof not because the cards told him to because the cards are a fallacy anyway they're a macguffin anyway but he threw him off the roof simply because he could and then in the end when he breaks into your home to kill you he's on the roof and he goes do you think i am paraphrasing him but do you think they're going to get me or catch me people like them never catch people like us and this is it's funny because this is where you've, you've problems with critics and with all these kind of things and I, I don't have a problem with critics in general. I think critics have, have a, a great function in cinema. But let's be realistic. At best, even at best, and I, I, I love some critics. Anthony Lane is one of the, the greatest writers I've ever encountered. Pauline Kael, the same. But, and I've probably read more of film criticism than many of these critics who are criticizing the film. But what I despise in this context is somebody who doesn't have the courage to recognize that their vision of cinema is only a very limited perspective and that if you deviate a millimeter away from their vision of what cinema should be somehow you are the one who's wrong and that's sad to see because if you look at charlie as a character and you look at charlie as a film it tries to go beyond the notion of dramatic structure it tries to go beyond the notion of the Aristotelian construct, every, everything we talked about. But when Charlie kills this person at the end, it was actually Damien O'Donnell. Damien O'Donnell, the great, brilliant director, Damien O'Donnell, he came to the reading, the original first reading we had, and he says, it's extraordinary, but Charlie needs to get away with it in the end. And this was a reading that a lot of people hated, and a lot of people despised the script and everything, and Damien was an extraordinary support. But he says he needs to get away with it in the end. And he was right. And it's the idea that in our safe universe, bad guys are punished and good guys succeed. Whereas in our reality, good guys are punished and bad guys succeed. That's what Charlie's about on the simplest level. Mm. Was, that, was that script uh, commissioned? No. Yeah. No. So it was just a labour of love? A labour of hate. I, you know, I got commissioned to write a lot of stuff and I had to pay a mortgage and pay kids and pay family and do all that stuff. But I was also broke a lot as well. But you have to sometimes get to the point where you go, why am I writing? And I was writing an awful lot of bullshit soap opera. And I have no one to blame for it by myself. But there were brilliant people working on it, like amazing people working on it. But you realize that it's, 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 it's advertising versus cinema. And Charlie was trying to be cinema. And I got murdered for it. Whereas if I had I had the insight or the foresight to make a little piece of advertising everybody would have been rewarded mm. what was the initial reaction when you when you when you start showing the script around well they hated it 